I'm here today with Shannon Crossbear. Shannon is one of the contributors to our new book, How to Heal Our Divides. So Shannon, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Brian. I'm really glad that you're part of this project. Um, maybe before we talk about your chapter, you could just kind of give us a little bit of background about you and what all you've done. Well, great. First, um, I'm just going to introduce myself in the Ojibwe language. So, Chimigwetch, Nikish Nikaz, Wabagonis, Minigijigat. I'm just going to greet you and with a good day in the Ojibwe language. Um, a lot of how I would introduce myself, Brian, is really not by so much what I've done, but who I am. And um, I'm a beautiful, powerful, spiritual woman um, whose purpose it is in life is to both demonstrate and promote gentle healing. I live in northern Minnesota. I'm on the shores of Lake Superior. I'm a mother and a grandmother. And my work in the world has all been about how do we do that healing. And so it's taken on a lot of different aspects throughout my years. And so uh, I've done a lot of work in the world um, are around uh, mental health and behavioral health in tribal and non-tribal communities. Um, I've done work around suicide prevention. Um, I've done work around how we think about healing in both Western uh, applications and indigenous knowledge around healing. And I've done a bunch of storytelling. So uh, a little bit of everything has kind of been my journey um, so far, um, my journey so far. So that's a little bit. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'm so glad that you're, you know, a part of this project. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got involved and why you decided to do this? Well, I, you know, I was, um, I had the pleasure and the opportunity to come and meet with these great writers, these spiritual writers. And I've done some writing in my life. Um, I'm compelled. I'm a compelled writer. I'm a, that means that I've written since I was young on everything, pieces of paper and napkins. And there's something about I had to get my ideas outside of myself and to record what it was that I saw in the world. And so I've always been a writer. I haven't made it my profession, although there was a time that I was writing. Um, I wrote for a number of years. I was a columnist for our local paper. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I was always surprised because we had a much larger readership than our county because people come from all over to visit here in northern Minnesota. And so they'd pick up the local paper and then they would continue to get the local paper when they were in their, their homelands. And um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and I've written, you know, for all kinds of different publications along the way, just a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So I had the, and I've, of course, seen other writers that I've looked at and aspired to and said, wow, I really like their writing. And um, I know nothing about writing or the publishing world or any of that. Um, and, and picked up a book and actually looked behind it and saw where it was published and then went and looked at the website and thought, wow, this is, I really like what they're doing. I really like kind of the thought process that they're going like this is this is really good stuff <laughs> and so um, I had an opportunity to come to one of the writing classes and um, and was blessed with a opportunity to do that and got to begin to hear about other writers and especially writers who are writing from a spiritual perspective and uh, meanwhile, I've been doing a lot of work around dismantling racism, um, partly because it, again, everything I do has come from who I am and what my experience in life so far has been. And so, um, so in different uh, venues and avenues, I've been having these conversations. I work with an organization called We the World, 
And we have been doing, holding some discussions that matter around um, racism and, uh, and how to uh, begin to address that. So when, um, Brian, when you shared this idea that you were gonna be doing this book and that you really wanted to be able to highlight things that were concrete, not identifying the problem yet again, not thinking about placing the blame, not thinking about all the things that, but also what are, what are the concrete ways that we can move forward, that we can begin to um, bridge that divide, we can begin to take the bricks down that um, create that wall um, and, and think about what we replace that with, right? So, um, so that's what inspired me to say, yes, and I hesitated. I, I didn't just like jump into it because I was like, uh, I, I'm not quite sure, really. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure how to do this, how to, I mean, that's a big question about, you know. <laughs> sure. And there's a lot of strategies. So I was challenged because I thought, well, I don't want to just say one way because there's not just one way. There's all, it's going to take all the ways. And um, we often talk about in my, you know, in my cultural orientation, we often talk about the fact that we need to heal the hoop of humanity. And in order to heal the hoop of humanity, we need everybody. We need all all hands on deck. <laughs> we need um, everything that everybody as an individual brings to the table so that we can rely upon the collective wisdom to get us where we need to go. So then, and, and I'm like, okay. So I thought about it for a while and I think you and I had a couple of back and forth um, to see if, you know, our thinking could be aligned in a way that would work for us both. And and then we did, and I've been working on it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate the effort that you've been putting into this, you know, Shannon, because I, I mean, I really wanted to, you know, include some Native American oriented organizations, you know, because uh, uh, I think it's just on a really such an important area for us to, to address. So, um, so tell us about how you landed on, you know, the folks that you did choose to, uh, to highlight in this chapter. Right. So, um, well, the first thing I do whenever I, I can't figure out what to do is um, I go to the water. <laughs> and I live right on, like I said, I live right on Lake Superior. So I, I was taking a walk down to the water and I thought, well, the only way that I can approach this is to approach it from the cultural world relational viewpoint that I come from. And that is to say, you know, what needs to be done when we think about healing, we often think about um, the fact that we're taught that when you are healing from something that you need to heal from the center out and that all healing needs to take place in your whole being, meaning anytime you have, whether it be a physical illness, that it affects you mentally, it affects you emotionally, it affects you spiritually or vice versa, that when you have something and you're not feeling well mentally that it will affect you physically. And, you know, so the, that interconnectedness is such a part of <clears throat> the way that I look at the world. And so as I thought about these organizations that I might highlight, I really thought about those four quadrants. And I said, well, who's doing kind of the work with the earth, the physical? Who's doing the work with food sovereignty? Um, and and uh, healthy nutrition and clean water, which are basic physical needs that we all have. Who's doing that work in Indian country and would welcome allies, would welcome helping hands to get that work done. And so that's how I um, decided that Honor the Earth would be and one of the organizations because of the work that they are doing, concentrating on those things, on you know the, the clean water sources, 
food sovereignty, um, and everything's connected. So you can't do that without having some justice issues involved and some health issues because of the disparities and as a result of not having clean water and those kinds of, so they're all kind of connected, even um, the, the issues around, uh, huge issues around murdered and missing indigenous women in this country that people are not aware of, but they're doing work around that as well. That's connected to the clean water, that's connected to the food sovereignty. So, um, so that was one of the reasons I highlighted them and then I kind of went okay well that that's physical what who's doing really 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 great work around um mental around really you know how we how educating about the the world and I I really thought about um an organization native wellness organ institute native wellness institute really has done fantastic work in kind of that all the reclamation kind of work that needs to be done language reclamation um, lots of emotional healing dealing with historical trauma and not only invites allies but actually um, gives them training and allows them to enter into the work so that really helps with that educational part of um, and thinking about that mental part. So I thought that they would be a really good, and they've just done, they've grown by leaps and bounds in the work that they have done. And they have a very uh, wide reach across, uh, not just in the US, but now uh, in terms of indigenous voices um, in other places as well. So pretty powerful. Um, and again, have a very concrete avenue for uh, folks to get involved. And then I was, well, who's done really good healing work um, emotionally in the, you know, kind of in Indian country and throughout the US and, and even Canada. And I thought of white bison. And they really came, they really as an organization uh, really were led to the work through um, the addictions field. And so substance use, which has been a, a huge issue in, our, um, in our, our Indian country. And they've done such great work and they've been around, but they also did a healing the hoop of humanity uh, across the nation. And so they went to different tribal nations with the hoop to bring um, that kind of healing. And out of that, they've also then developed um, a, what they call the well-briety movement. So it's not just about uh, being sober or being free from those kinds of substances, but what does it really mean to be well, to have a total wellness and well-briety? And so they've been um, leaders in that. And again, offer avenues for anybody to get involved and support the work that they're doing. And so that's really powerful. So then I was left with, okay, now I've looked at those other three quadrants. Now I have one more quadrant. I've got the spiritual quadrant. Well, everything is spiritual. So, um, you know, uh, so how, how do you kind of separate that out? But what I reflected upon was the teachings that we have that um, our children are sacred. And it's our youth and what we're doing that affects the next seven generations. And so we honor the ancestors, the seven generations before us that really allowed us to be here having this conversation, Brian, right now. And at the same time, being very conscious of how are we ensuring the future? And so I chose um, the Center for Native American Youth which is supported by the Aspen uh, Foundation and our institute rather. And um, I chose them because of the work that they're doing around youth and leadership and how um, all of the different avenues about how we're growing the next generation of leaders in uh, Indian country. And that is another, again, another place where I think 
a concrete hands-on, um, as I say, hands to do the work and hands to hold, you know, that both are needed. So that was kind of my thinking around that. Well, that's really wonderful. Um, what a spectrum, you know, of different areas of focus and types of organizations that um, you've uncovered and that you've told people about. And, you know, certainly, as, as you know, from the whole motivation for the book, uh, we want to give people an opportunity to get involved and, you know, try to participate in doing something about addressing these issues. So I'm really happy that you focused on <clears throat> organizations that are very practical about that and very open about, you know, uh, accepting uh, involvement. Yeah, my, um, I think I, and I'll, I think I said this in the, in the uh, writing too, is that <clears throat> my good friend, um, one of my friends, Menage Hill from Standing Rock, we always try to acknowledge when we, where we got something from. <laughs> um, and he said long ago, we were at a meeting and he was, we had some, uh, non-native folks that were there and he said well if you want to learn about us you go to the library look up all that information but if you want to know and understand us come and live with us and I never forgot that because they think that that's what it takes in order to heal the divide I think a part of that is that we need to be in the same spaces we need to be you know picking up the same you know, piece of wood or whatever it is that we're doing together to build this. Because like I said, we're, we're yes, we're um, tearing down the divide, but at the same time, we're building the connection. And so that building really requires that we do it together. Um, and there's nothing better than if you have a task to do it together. Absolutely. And this has been a common theme throughout this book and all the different organizations that, um, you know, are being described is that uh, this is a very grassroots kind of thing that has to be done on a broad, you know, pervasive, uh, distributed basis. Mm. And it won't, it won't happen just online. You know, I mean, it won't happen just right, right. or anything like that. It's got to be personal relationships. And it is, and I think it is kind of, sometimes it's, the, it is that very um, concrete task oriented activity. Uh, years ago, I ended up, <clears throat> and I was quite young at the time, and I ended up going to a community in Northern Ontario. And, um, and we were, it was my husband and I, and we were going there for a particular um, job, but we couldn't enter into the community with that job. We had to enter into the community with our other skills, right? So we were entering into the community to do some work around addictions. Um, we were thinking that this is a lot of years ago, so all the terminologies have changed, but at the time it was, I think we were chemical dependency counselors, and we were going into an isolated um, tribal community in the far north where they had a they were experiencing some really high um, addiction rates with uh, some really poor outcomes and so <clears throat> we were supposed to go in there and do uh, do counseling and um, but that was not the way that we could enter into the community so uh, my husband had some electrical skills, so he had some, he was an electrician, um, had that trade, and um, and I had some other skills, and we, uh, even though I was young, but we <laughs> we managed to do those. That was our introduction into the community. What can we help you wire? What can we help you do this? You know, let's do this together. And it was at that point that we gained our. Uh, ability to be part of the community um, and to contribute to the community and then we could offer the things the other things that we wanted to offer so um, it was uh, that was a really I was really young at the time but it was a really good lesson for me in terms of how do you really 
connect. You connect by giving somebody something that they're asking for. And I think that was the other thing too, is rather than to offer what it is you think that people need is, what is it they're, they're asking for? And that's the thing that's gonna be most helpful, right? Yeah, that's the yeah. thing that will heal the divide. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as you said, I mean, kind of like establishing a relationship and establishing trust you know, is a precursor for a lot of the other things that, you know, we want to try to accomplish. Right. right. And, and, I, and I think the other thing that sometimes stops us is that we're afraid. <laughs> I'm laughing because, of course, we're going to make mistakes. You know, but we're afraid we're going to make mistakes. And, of course, you're going to make mistakes, right? You know, but that the difference between... You know, I think making that mistake is is what we call, I guess it would be going with a good heart. It's not intent. If you're if you have good intent, you're gonna make mistakes and then you're gonna listen when you make mistakes and you're going to do it differently the next time. That's all. You know, it's it's pretty um it's pretty simple. You're that's part of our human condition is that we're going to make mistakes. Absolutely. And, it's just part of the process. And we're going to have, and we're going to have those times. I think, you know, I, I experience them where we have that, what I call the ouch or the cultural bump, you know, um, and sometimes it's easy to identify that cultural bump, you know, because it's, it's obvious, but sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it, t even for me, sometimes when I come up against something that, I don't even realize till later where that's coming from, that it's a, that there's a cultural bump that I, I have to identify, right? So, you know, I, I always say, um, you know, I, I hear a lot of movements about, you know, non-judgment and, you know, all those kinds of movements. And I, I just think that that's not possible. We're judgment making machines. <laughs> Or, you know, and, and it serves us to, to, to have discernment. And it's not a bad thing to have discernment, discernment and judgment. We're, we're called upon. That's part of our human condition. But we can hold those lightly, right? And that's, I think that's where that's, for me, it's that sweet spot of holding that judgment lightly so that you can allow other information to come. It's that place between breathing in and breathing out where the pause is to just take the pause. Oh, maybe I'm interpreting this in a different way. Right. And humor plays a big part. I have to laugh at myself because I'm just, I, in our prayers, we always say, um, we have, there's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of this, it loosely translates to, you know, take pity upon me. I'm just a poor human being. <laughs> and that, I mean, and it's said quite yeah. often in our prayers, take pity on me. I'm a poor human being knowing that. Uh, so I think there's a degree of humor that I have with even myself. I, I I'll share a little story with you that um, a few years back, I could get passionate about certain subjects <laughs> and um as you may or may not have guessed already. And I was somehow, I was with non-Native people and it was a couple of gals, three gals, and we were just having a nice little evening together and, you know, cheese and chatting and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and somehow we got on Indian housing, right? And it must have been a button for me because <laughs> I went off. I was talking all about, you know, well, what they used to do for our Indian housing and, and how they used to build the houses and, you know, and, and they would build these houses and they wouldn't have closets. What did they think? Did they think that Indians didn't have clothes? How come they never built us closet? And I mean, I was on a roll about the fact that uh, Indian health services in their houses in the fifties and sixties never had closets. They never, you know, so one of the gals who is very, uh, she's non-native, very soft-spoken and never heard her raise her voice. She slammed her fist on the table and she said, Shannon. 
And internally, I thought, oh my gosh, I must have crossed some kind of cultural thing that I didn't know about. Because she was like, she was like, and and everybody stopped because they're not used to this person raising their voice. And she said very slowly, she said, we all know Indians had clothes. And then there was a pause and she said, but we also knew they did not have hangers. <laughs> and, and, and I was so shocked by the way that she said it, right? <sighs> and, and she just deadpanned it, right? And I just, and I know my mouth fell open and I'm like, it's about the hangers? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. You know, and so I started to laugh, right? And, I, and we all laughed, right? And after that, I have to tell you, Brian, there were people who actually heard that story and sent me hangers. But, um, <laughs> and, but, the, uh, but the, what happens to, it a, was a wonderful thing for me because what happens internally to me is when I find myself in that position where I'm just like full speed ahead, you know, trying to impress upon somebody some injustice that I have felt, you know, um, I, I stop, I hold that judgment lightly. And I say to myself, Shannon, you know, it could be about the hangers. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, step back, another perspective, right? <laughs> holding, holding myself to another perspective. Yeah. So that's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Yeah. <laughs> so Shannon, I just wanted to, uh, to thank you again for uh, participating in this, this program. And I think it's so wonderful that, we're going to spread the news about these organizations that are doing such good work and hopefully um, increase people's involvement. Great. Yeah. The more the merrier. We need all the help. They, they say in order to um, heal the sacred hoop of humanity, we need everybody's hands, everybody's hearts and everybody's hands. And this is one way to um, let your heart sing by finding a place within one of these organizations where you can do what makes your heart sing. Good, good, good. Well, Shannon, thank you again personally too for you know taking the time and effort to, to do all of this. Um, I, I just greatly appreciate it. You're welcome, Brian.